Ladies and gentlemen, people of the internet, welcome back to yet another episode of Crypto Over Coffee. I hope you're doing well today. And if you're new here, every Saturday, we break down the latest news and the hottest topics in the world of technology and cryptocurrency over a cup of delicious coffee, which today is from Onyx Coffee Roasters. It is Eugenoides. You can look that up. It's pretty cool. That being said, in today's episode, I'm talking about the crazy crypto market right now. Are we in a bear market? We're talking about Cardano, Cosmos, our usual 404 Logic Not Found segment and more. So make sure you stick around for all the updates. Now, if you like crypto, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification button, or follow the podcast on your platform of choice so you can get a heads up whenever I post new episodes of Crypto Over Coffee. Just a friendly reminder as well, please be aware of scammers that are in the comments posing as me on YouTube. They're also posing as other crypto YouTubers, not just me. I also don't have a WhatsApp. I'm not going to ask you to contact me on Telegram. I'm not going to reach out to you. I'm not going to ask you for money or try to sell you something. Long story short, be careful of scammers. If you're on YouTube, the comments, make sure you check if that name is highlighted and you got the verification check. And if you don't see it, it's not me and you can report them. So please be safe. Today, I will also be giving away one Keystone Vault hardware wallet to a lucky person who leaves a comment on today's video, which will be randomly drawn. So you can comment now to go ahead and enter. Now, I'd originally planned to start the show today with news about Cardano's recent DeFi milestones, but given the circumstances that I, I'm sure everyone's aware of, I felt it necessary to start with a crypto market update first. So I think it's needless to say that things are not looking great right now, with Bitcoin losing support at 40k and sinking into the mid to low 30ks, and the rest of the market, as you know, follows suit to Bitcoin in large part. At this moment in time, at the time of recording, Bitcoin is metrics-wise oversold to the point that it was in March of 2020 during the Black Swan market event that saw it recede to only a few thousand bucks per Bitcoin. However, this time around, there's not a singular event that's leading to this price action that can explain it. Now, over the last three weeks or four weeks, I've expressed my trepidation in saying that we've seen the market bottom and that it was possible that 38K was it, and clearly it wasn't. And as I discussed in those previous videos, macroeconomic conditions that are outside of our control really move the market for risk assets like crypto and equities. And that is what's playing a huge part here. In those previous shows, I talked about the Federal Reserve's actions and how those affect risk assets like crypto and equities. And I said that this is a bear market given the price action sustained over time. And to get out of this bear market, we will need some turnaround on the macroeconomic conditions therein. This is the beginning stage of a bear market. And that still rings true. There's uncertainty around the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, trimming the balance sheet of securities, and of course, around policy related to crypto with Bitcoin energy usage and even stable coins and DeFi being pinpointed in legislative bodies around the world right now. You can also sprinkle on the unbridled panic about MicroStrategy, one of the biggest Bitcoin holders, now reportedly being under investigation by the SEC for its Bitcoin buy accounting practices. And this compounding fear leads to increasing volatility in the market. And subsequently, even modest selling and negative price action can trigger a much more steep sell-off as panic sets in and people trim their positions. And the obvious question on everyone's mind right now is, what happens next? And this question is reasonable, it's normal, but sadly, there's no concrete answer. This can go, in my mind, one of two main ways. It could be that we continue to sell off until we hit sort of a bottom or capitulation, and then we potentially flip back to a longer term positive price action environment like we did in March 2020. That would be like the best case scenario and only really possible in my view if we get some clarity or reversal on the Federal Reserve policies and macroeconomic stuff that I talked about. Not sure how likely it is in the short term. The other way this could go is the way that no one wants to hear about, and that is a longer term bear market confirmation. The truth is, I've personally been through a couple of these, or a few if you count the Bitcoin only days way back when, where the market was like the size of a peanut. But 2018 was a shining example of the start of a long bear market. The begging on the soapbox over the last several months to have a plan for a long term bear market has been for good reason on this channel because bull markets don't last forever and having a plan in place for the worst case scenario is the only thing that can stem the losses in these situations. If I had to look at this from a purely probabilistic viewpoint, 
I would say that it's very possible that we're entering the start of a long-term bear market, which is a narrative that would be supported by the price action trend right now. However, you know that things in crypto can change on a dime. We could flip back to positive price action just as fast as we turned to negative price action, but it's far from guaranteed and you have to plan accordingly. Well, realistically, you would have had to plan already, but making another plan now helps. If we do find ourselves in a long-term bear market and we get that further large-scale sell-off that that would entail, the focus shifts again to building for many projects. Lots of YouTubers and influencers are going to leave the space in the absence of easy money. The news is going to stop covering crypto so often. A lot of the regulatory heat might cool off. And many projects are going to fail. And this is like a mass consolidation in the market when this happens, in the space. And it sets the stage for the next phase of adoption and maturity. And I know that no one wants to hear about a bear market and many are gonna hate me for it and the comments are gonna tell me it's not a bear market. And all I can do is give you what I deem to be what's probable based on the data that I have right now. It's an educated guess, but it's still a guess. And you have to protect your family and yourself and play the market how you see it, not how I see it. I'm one guy with some long-term experience in the space, but I'm no better or smarter than you. And I'll be here creating educational content, whether prices are up or down, because I'm in this for the long haul. Now, as I'd originally attended, I also want to cover Cardano's recent DeFi activity on mainnet, which does mark a huge milestone for Cardano's burgeoning DAP ecosystem. Make no mistake, Cardano's uptake for meaningful DAP volume has been slow. There's no denying that. There's no disputing that. But let's be truly honest about why that is. First of all, Plutus, the smart contract language for Cardano that is based on the Haskell programming language is not easy to learn for those without a strong functional programming background. And even then it can be a little bit of a steep learning curve. Beyond that, the native EUTXO model that Cardano employs and the general dynamics of the network that dictate the design of a DAP architecturally and functionally are wildly different from Ethereum and basically every other blockchain that exists today where other people might have experience. So this is a brand new paradigm for builders, and as such, it takes time to do things right for the very first time. This rate of building will start to accelerate rapidly, just like it did after the slow start on Ethereum back in the day. I remember this happening. The launch that sort of kicked everything off into high gear in terms of conversation, though, was Sunday Swap, the first automated market maker or AMM DEX in Cardano. And that followed the first ever DEX that actually doesn't get enough appreciation, Muesli Swap, which uses the order book model, sort of the opposite of the AMM model. On Cardano's EUTXO blockchain, order books that match buy and sell orders are maybe the more efficient and native solution, but taking the liquidity pool driven automated market maker model popularized by Uniswap is a lot tougher to achieve. And so Sunday Swap was clear in its pre-release material that there would be many pending orders, wallets might struggle, there might be congestion, things might take time to fill, there will be failed transactions, etc. right? They were very clear. And that was true, of course. The first transaction load that took place on Sunday Swap took the Cardano network to transaction load levels that it hadn't seen even during large NFT drops. Things behaved as expected though, for the most part, issues and all, but people were still angry with the slowness and failed or delayed transactions. And I get that completely. However, this is where things start to get exciting because with this mainnet launch, proving hypotheses and design criteria as viable, improvements can be made and others can learn from these lessons as they launch their own dApps. And not only that, the wallets and other utilities that need to be there to make these things work can learn from this as well. It's a part of the maturity process and finding these solutions. And this type of trial by fire is what drives and accelerates new things being built and helps formulate best practices. But what this also displays is that Cardano's Hydra scaling solution is much needed and will arrive to even more fanfare than it already would have, helping the network scale on demand for these types of high demand transactional waves. Now, most of all, I want to congratulate the Sunday Swap team for taking their time to launch this, to do it right, even knowing that no matter what they did, there would be anger about congestion, there'd be finger pointing and blame and failed swaps. That wasn't in their control, to be quite honest. I also want to give a due credit to the Muesli Swap team, whose quiet launch of the order book exchange on Cardano was met with a lot less excitement, but was equally important to the development of dApps on Cardano. So congratulations to both of those teams. And this is only the beginning. There are countless DeFi primitives and other utilities that will be launching here soon, and it will only accelerate from here.
So the future is bright, bear market or not. That's my genuine belief. And by the way, if you're a Cardano NFT fan, make sure you come hang out with me on the CNFT Awards show. I don't know why I'm struggling saying that today, but it is happening in February. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be really fun. And you can vote for your favorite NFT projects in the CNFT space on the webpage for the award show. So I'll leave that link in the description and pinned comment for any Cardano fans who want to participate. And I do want to quickly share some big news about one of the channel sponsors I Trust Capital, who offer cryptocurrency individual retirement accounts, or IRAs, for U.S. crypto investors who want to trade crypto with pre-tax or after-tax money. I've used their products for a long while now. I have IRAs with I Trust Capital as a part of my crypto investing strategy, and it lets me trade a little bit more aggressively during periods of volatility without having to worry about individual trade tax implications. And so I Trust Capital already supports a wide range of cryptocurrencies, has top-notch custody services, and they will now be doubling down on new features and improvements to the product with funds that were raised in a recent Series A round that totaled about $125 million. And these funds will be used to create new useful features and services for iTrust Capital users and to potentially explore strategic acquisitions, according to reports from the iTrust Capital team. So if you haven't already, you can sign up for iTrust Capital using the link in the description and the pinned comment and you can earn $100 in Bitcoin as a reward for new accounts opened on the service. If you do end up joining and you have questions, let me know. I would be more than happy to help. I'm a huge fan of iTrust and I'm very, very thankful that they've sponsored the show. In other news, the premier decentralized exchange in the Cosmos ecosystem, as people are calling it now, the Cosmos, Osmosis has been tracking towards launching a powerful new feature dubbed Superfluid Staking. And it seems that work on this has been progressing very nicely based on the GitHub activity that I've been able to watch. So superfluid staking will basically allow osmosis liquidity pool providers of token pairs to stake their LP tokens on native chains for those token pairs. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means in a second. What this effectively allows is liquidity providers to earn from fees from their liquidity provisioning on Osmosis, but also to contribute to the native blockchains for their contributed token pairs via staking. So for example, a provider of a Luna Osmo pair to a liquidity pool can then receive the LP tokens for that pool to then stake on the Osmosis and Terra blockchains. So this is significant because it removes one of the opportunity costs associated with contributing to liquidity pools, but it also allows like large holders who contribute to these pools to also participate in network governance on the various blockchains for which they hold tokens. So this is a pretty big feature that I hope comes to fruition in 2022, but I figured I'd put it in front of you just in case you've never seen it before. Now, before we dive into rational reactions, I wanna issue a correction because in last week's episode, while talking off the cuff about some of the behavior that I'm not a huge fan of from President Bukele of El Salvador in the wake of making Bitcoin legal tender in the country, I made a mistake in the way I presented the information. The way I presented that off the cuff segment made it seem like the mandate is for citizens to use Bitcoin on a day-to-day basis, and, and that's not the case. Merchants are the ones who are obliged to accept Bitcoin. And I wanted to make that distinction clear because I didn't do so last week in the way I presented it. Bitcoin is only really forced upon these merchants in a sense. So I got that part wrong. I appreciate your understanding, but let it be known that I support the idea that Bitcoin is a tool for freedom, but it has to be wielded by the people by choice to truly be so. And I hope that El Salvador proves my and the others who share concerns about the way this is going on completely wrong. Fingers crossed. So with that out of the way, let's dive into Rational Reactions, where I read headlines from the tech and crypto-related publications and give you my instant rational reaction. So let's switch over to the computer, and we can go ahead and get started on this one. All right, looks like the first story is from Cointelegraph, and that is by Andrew Singer. And the headline reads, Does a Fed digital dollar leave any room for crypto stablecoins? Could stablecoins be undone by a Federal Reserve that takes customer or consumer deposits, excuse me, would retail banks be hobbled? So I want to react to this in general about a digital dollar. You know how I feel about this. We've talked about this before. A digital dollar will only be viable and will only get my support around the world. And this is for every currency, euro, pound, dollar, I don't care what it is. It only has my support if the people have equal governance capabilities, voting-based governance capabilities 
to govern that currency and its issuance. If they don't have that, it does not have my support. It needs to be a tool for freedom. Unfortunately, most of the time, digital dollars will, and digital euros or whatever it is, CBDCs in general, more likely than not could be, I'm not saying they would be, but could be used as a surveillance tool. You would be able to get shut out of the financial system at the flick of a switch. You would have zero privacy implicitly with the way you exchange those dollars or those euros or those pounds. I'm not happy about that idea. So the reality is, is I hope, I hope that the digital dollar does not come to fruition in that way. But even if it did, there would still be room for crypto stable coins around the world. They could be made illegal though, and that would be a tricky regulatory thing. Lots going on in this kind of story. This is going to develop over the next couple years. No doubt about that. Next story is from Cointelegraph again. Robinhood crypto wallet testing is live. A thousand users can now withdraw. The popular stock and crypto trading platform will allow crypto withdrawals to a limited number of users who signed up for the crypto wallet waitlist program. This is several years too late. I was maybe a little, uh, I wasn't harsh enough on Robinhood early on in their crypto release because I was excited that they were giving access to people and they didn't have a withdrawal functionality. And I, I thought, you know, maybe that's okay in the short term. I was wrong on that. Clearly, they didn't take this seriously, and I don't understand why it took so long for them to actually make this happen. This is not incredibly complex functionality, to be quite honest with you. There's got to be some story to this, whether it's regulatory or whatever, but it's way too late for them to be releasing this functionality. And it's very interesting how this is only really coming to fruition now that the markets are down. It just it really bothers me the way this is played out. I'm not saying there's some conspiracy or anything. I'm just saying there's no reason why they should have waited this long to release this feature. And they're only testing it now. They're not even really rolling it out. It doesn't make any sense. I wish they had done this ages ago. The next story is from Coindesk. EOS creator Dan Larimer is back. After the developer left Block One last year, the network's new stewards are hoping to spark an EOS renaissance. So it seems that Dan Larimer is back in the fold for EOS, which was his original brainchild after some of the other projects that he's worked on. What's interesting to me is that Dan Larimer traditionally has created one thing, then left, created another thing, then left, created another thing, and then left. What seems to be the case here is that he left, maybe took stock, did a bunch of research and work, now knows I have a plan for EOS. What's going to be interesting is does the EOS community and now the existing stewards, quote unquote, of EOS welcome him back in a, a big way? Or maybe is there some residual anger about the way that he left in the first place? I really actually do have high hopes that EOS can turn it around because Nothing is too late really in crypto. We're still very early. There's a chance it could reverse some of the bad decisions that were made in its design. This is going to be a very interesting story to watch unfold, especially if we do enter a longer term bear market where the building phase comes back. It'll be very interesting. So who knows? I'm open minded here. Next question, or I think the last, not question, geez, I'm already thinking about Q&A, uh, but the next story is on Coindesk again. Bitcoin mining difficulty sets a new all-time high. The measure of Bitcoin mining difficulty will likely continue hitting record highs well into 2022. Now, this is another one of those interesting ones where you start to see a, an incongruence in the on-chain metrics and the price. Traditionally, and, and this is not maybe a really heavy correlation, but traditionally you've seen hash rate and difficulty on mining Bitcoin overall correlate with higher prices. And right now you have a very, very stark incongruence in that where price is tanking and these metrics are still continuing to rise and rise and rise and rise and rise. There's more, uh, there's more hash rate on the network. The difficulty is as a result rising. I think this recent one was the one of the largest increases in difficulty in, in the recent past. So it's really interesting to see how these metrics are starting to change and the way that we've traditionally thought about them. And it will start to change the way of thinking and how we do on-chain metric analysis if these types of trends continue to sort of break the way we previously used to read them. So very interesting stuff. Uh, I know Rational Reaction is a little shorter this time. We've got a couple more things to talk about. So let's go ahead and talk 404 logic not found now. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for 404 Logic Not Found. And for those of you who are as of yet uninitiated in this little firecracker of a segment, I highlight notable tech-related fails or otherwise stupid moves in the world. 
that need to get some attention, right? And if you are thinking about attention right now, you want to help this episode of Crypto Over Coffee get some attention from the algorithm robots that kind of control the show here, please hit the like button, get subscribed, follow the podcast, share it with your friend. It tells those robots that you're enjoying the content and others might also enjoy it. And it really, really helps the show. So thank you so much for that in advance. Today's absence of logic is squarely focused on the hypocrisy around the bashing that occurs between communities when prices are down, finger pointing at others for shilling coins that put people in a lost position. Now, a great example of this is the prevalence of Bitcoin and Ethereum maximalists bashing Elon Musk and Mark Cuban for talking about Dogecoin, given that most people who bought Doge at prices like 30 cents or 40 cents are now in a pretty significant loss position. Now, it's not that I disagree with that criticism. I mean, these guys have huge influence and they should be more responsible with that influence. But are we really going to play this game? It's a little bit backwards. It's like the glass houses thing. All the Bitcoin and Ethereum maximalists, for example, and don't worry, it's not just them. It's every shiller on social media pushing their favorite token or coin. These people should not be so loud about shilling and putting people in a loss and how bad that is and shilling at the top. Because if you think about it, Think about all the times that the Bitcoin community preaches about buying the dip, and buying Bitcoin, even at or near all-time highs because of the long-term potential. TikTok next block, right? How about all the ultrasound money Ethereum maxis screaming that Ether is far superior to Bitcoin and to buy, but of course, not financial advice. All these people are doing the same thing they're criticizing Cuban and Musk for, just at a smaller scale. Because new people in crypto don't know the difference. They see someone with a little bit of influence and they listen. And tons of people bought Ether at 4K or Bitcoin above 60K. And they're now close to 30, or sorry, 30 to 50% down on those investments. And yes, every individual who buys things bears their own responsibility for doing that. They spent the money, but let's not pretend like calls for 10K ETH and 100K Bitcoin as a promise didn't push people to buy on a false pretense. You can't promise price predictions. You have no idea. So yes, Cuban and Musk should feel somewhat responsible for people losing on Dogecoin, but so should every shiller on social media for calling to action to buy for huge prices for their own favorite coin. Nothing in this space is guaranteed, and not everyone is operating on the same time horizon that another person is. What's a good investment for one person might not be for someone else. For example, one person could buy Bitcoin at 60K, hold through a bear market down 60 to 80% for a year and a half, and then wait all the way till the next bull cycle, and then recoup their money. Others will need that money out quickly on a short time horizon. That's the difference. Low time preference is a blessing that not everyone is endowed with, unfortunately. And as such, if this is a bear market that we're entering into, let's all promise ourselves that next time around, we're not going to spend so much time pointing fingers and blaming others when markets are down, but working towards educating and building a better community around crypto that's not based just purely on speculation and getting rich quick. One thing is for sure, selectively applying criticism towards those shilling inflated expectations and promises of prices is a 404 logic not found. Now, I would also like to quickly thank the sponsor of today's specific episode, Hypersign, who I shared with you last week as well, and they're building a framework for self-sovereign identity. In other words, Hypersign envisions a world where you and I own our own data, and our identity is denominated by attestations of identity attributes that we own in our cryptographically secured and backed wallet. This decentralized identity methodology is one that's become deeply rooted in the blockchain and crypto community. And that's for good reason, because it's a tool for putting control of one's personal data back in one's own control. And in keeping with some of the cosmos heavy themes of previous shows, Hypersign is working on a proposal to establish an interoperable cross-chain decentralized identity standard for the cosmos ecosystem using the powerful IBC protocol for core communications, of course. Currently, Hypersign is developing a draft proposal with the IBC team or the Interblockchain Communication team, and I would encourage you to engage in that conversation with the Hypersign team if you have ideas for this proposal, features that you'd like included in the spec, comments, so on and so forth. And by the way, the target testnet date for this DID network is slated for Q4 2022, so building mode is online for Hypersign. 
All right, folks, let's do some community q and I always answer questions from folks who watch the show, and I've got some questions from last week's episode that I'm going to answer here. And I do want to remind you that if you have your own question that you want answered on the show, leave them in the comments on YouTube. Or if you're listening on the podcast side, you don't have access to the comments, you can tweet me at Hishoshi4 on Twitter as well. All right, let's dive into these questions and see what we've got. All right, first question of the day is from Alphonse. Question, would the anticipated rate hikes of the Fed, so raising interest rates, and eventually the European Central Bank mean a drop in liquidity that has been injected in cryptocurrencies due to better alternatives? Or do you think or know that this will not have a large effect on liquidity? Now, Alphonse, no one can ever tell you for sure what's gonna happen because these things are speculative and probabilistic in nature. However, based on what we've already been seeing, liquidity is flowing out of crypto and out of equities in general and out of risk assets because of the anticipation of this change in these rate hikes. That, that is just the truth. And if you look back at, at the past, this same pattern has evolved. So you've seen crypto dropping into you know, the $1.6, $1.7 trillion market cap by the last time I checked, at least it might be different now. And you're seeing liquidity just bleeding out of the crypto market and out of equities. And I do think that this is going to continue until there's clarity about the actions that are going to be taken by these central banks and you know these organizations because people react to speculation. It's the sort of uh, buy the rumor, sell the news. It's the same thing, but in reverse here. There's a rumor that the Fed is going to do this or the ECB is gonna do this. And then all of a sudden people react to it. They they sell the rumor, right? And so it's it's very interesting to watch this unfold, but we really don't know how this is going to play out. What if there's a continuation of the economic issues that are going on right now? Printing needs to resume. There needs to be uh, more quantitative easing, more asset purchasing, and you flip the script completely from rate hikes and rates do not go up. Then what? Maybe money starts flowing back into risk assets, but it's really hard to say for sure what's going to happen. So it's important that everyone plans for both scenarios. It's very, very important. So thank you for your question. That's my speculation. That's my thought about it. Other people may disagree. Next question is from Dare Fitzpatrick. What's your current recommendation for a hardware wallet in 2022? I have three that I really recommend right now. And these are the main ones, okay? There are others that I really like. These are the main ones. Because most of the world is driven by uh, sort of MetaMask, right? The world of Avalanche and Phantom and BSC and Ethereum, all these places people interact with using your MetaMask connected, hopefully, to a hardware wallet. You should be doing this, okay? So I'm going to select the main three that are compatible with MetaMask. Trezor, the Model T, supports EIP-712, very important. Uh, Model T is pretty good. There's some little weird things about the integration with MetaMask and some little weird things about the onboard firmware in terms of not playing as well with Polygon, for example. But those things are getting ironed out. I use a Trezor Model T every single day with MetaMask. I also use a Ledger Nano X almost every single day as well for a lot of different things. I love both of those wallets. They're great. I'll leave links to them in the description below. But I also want to shout out another wallet that not many people know about that works really well with MetaMask, and that is the Keystone Vault. The Keystone Vault and the Keystone Vault Pro, which I talk about on the channel all the time, they interact with the QR code standard now supported in MetaMask, and people don't really realize that. And that mobile form factor, it's like a mobile phone, it is so much nicer to deal with, and you don't have a USB cable tethering you to your computer. It's so much nicer to deal with on MetaMask. I highly recommend the Keystone. I use the Keystone all the time, especially when I'm on the go, because it's really easy for me to use. If I'm on a plane, for example, it's it's a, it's fantastic. So the way that I would say this is any of those wallets would be good. You might want to get a combination of them to kind of split your assets up. It's completely up to you, but those are the three that I really recommend. We'll leave just links in the description below. Thank you for your question. And we're going to do fewer questions today. I'm trying to end as close to 30 minutes per your feedback. Last question is from John Philippe L. If you had to choose just one blockchain on which to develop, which one would you choose? People are going to be pissed off about this, but right now it would still be Ethereum despite the gas fees. Why? Because Ethereum has a large amount of liquidity. You also have the ability to get to a lot of these other side chains or other ancillary chains, Phantom, 
Avalanche, Polygon, all these other places that also have big communities that are interested in holding assets and exchanging and buying. And you then have this ability to pretty much immediately go cross chain. That's just the truth. I do think that Ethereum scalability is gonna be solved, but I do realize that a lot of builders are building elsewhere because of this. A few honorable mentions, Algorand is just starting to get the, the building mode going, exciting stuff. Cardano, we talked about it today. Building is going really well there behind the scenes. People think it's going slow. I get it, just wait and see. And then there's also, of course, the Cosmos ecosystem right now is really appealing to build in. And if I were building, if I had to say, based on my skill set, if I had to build in one other place, it would be Cosmos right now other than Ethereum, based on my skill set. It's not necessarily that Cosmos is better than everything else. It's fantastic. For my skill set, Cosmos would probably be where I build now next. But I'm too busy for that, so I can't really do it anyways. But hypothetically speaking, of course. Now, thank you for your questions today, folks. Thanks for being patient with this episode. I have a crushing migraine today, and I'm trying to like push through and like actually deliver the episode with some modicum of energy. Uh, so really, really appreciate you doing that and sticking with me today, even though the episode is late. So thank you so much for watching. If you have time to stick around, I'll leave more of the videos linked up here for you to watch. Of course, as always, please stay safe in the markets. Go outside, enjoy time with family. Don't stress about this as much as you can. Hope you and your family have a great week ahead. Until next time, cheers.